Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux Newslog is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. And with that, let's go ahead and get into the stories for this episode. Starting off over at eWeek.com, BlackBerry Classic harks back to the bold 9900 to lure business loyalists. BlackBerry, on December 17th, formally announced its latest hopeful attempt to stem the flow of customers to rival device makers by introducing a thoroughly new phone that looks very much like the company's last successful mobile phone model, the much-loved BlackBerry Bold 9900. While the new BlackBerry Classic isn't a copy of the Bold 9900, it looks and is said to feel a lot like one. And they have a picture of it here, and it looks like uh, 9900. Uh, the goal, according to CEO John Chen, is to bring back a totally business-focused device designed specifically for the needs of its most loyal users. The BlackBerry Classic includes a keyboard, physical navigation keys, and long battery life. Deep down inside, however, the new BlackBerry runs the QNX-based BBOS 10, which, among other things, can run many Android apps. So it's essentially an Android phone under the covers with BlackBerry's unique uh, business-centric twist, if you will. So it uh, should be pretty interesting. I'm curious to see how well it sells. I mean, BlackBerry has, you know, for the most part, been hemorrhaging, uh, you know, customers and cash and has been in major trouble for quite some time. So I'll be interested to see what they do uh, with regards to this, or how they do anyway. From uh, CBS Local, or Detroit.CBSLocal.com, uh, Instagram releases new filters for photo sharing for their photo sharing app. This is kind of cool. The popular photo sharing and editing app Instagram has released five new photo filters for users. I've personally tr played with them a little bit. Pretty neat. Uh, Instagram, which has grown to 300 million users since it's launched four years ago, which adds everything from different colors to a haze to photos. So uh, photography trends have evolved and the capabilities of the camera on your phone have vastly improved according to a post on the Instagram blog. So uh, they're saying they've seen creative, uh, tremendous creativity within the community, not only in the moments they share, but in the time spent carefully composing and editing photos and videos to bring out emotions and make them beautiful. So there's a number of new filters, uh, Slumber, Crema, Ludwig, Perpetua, and Aiden, uh, pretty interesting. Like I said, I've, I've monkeyed around with them a little bit, and they're better than the old filters, so pretty cool. From Mashable.com, LG to launch the next version of WebOS for smart TVs at CES. We all know CES is right around the corner. It's only a few weeks away. Uh, so WebOS is getting another update from LG. They plan, LG plans to launch the next version of its smart TV platform at the upcoming Consumer Electronics Show. Um, for those of you who may or may not remember, we've reported on WebOS actually a number of times over the years. It's the mobile operating system created by Palm to power the company's early smartphones. In 2010, Hewlett Packard acquired it for $1.2 billion and then shuttered the company a year later. What? <laughs> yeah. LG resurrected the platform in 2013 to power its growing lineup of smart TVs. So, you know, WebOS has kind of had this really rocky, what the heck is going on? And uh, hopefully uh, they will, um, you know, hopefully they'll have a, you know, I'm not a hu huge fan of smart TVs. I think your TV should do one thing and one thing very well, which is display content that is fed to it. It shouldn't necessarily have uh you know uh, basically a pc in it you know that's why we have amazon fire tvs and netflix boxes and roku's and all that other stuff the the, t the display device itself like a computer monitor you know computer monitor only does really one thing and one thing really well and a tv it should be the same but anyway regardless of that if you're going to integrate something like web os into a smart tv i hope they do it really well and that it has at least well enough that it'll have a long enough a, a fairly long life uh, 
in the TV line because WebOS showed a lot of promise. I was I was really actually hopeful, <laughs> was a little disappointed at a few times it went off to the wayside because companies did whatever they were going to do. But uh, still, you know, it was one of those things where it was like, it'd be great if we could get that, right? So anyway, uh, the next story that we have is from Tom'sHardware.com. Samsung may partner with Loop Pay to create an Apple Pay competitor. This is uh, kind of interesting. Um, I, I've not actually monkeyed around too much with Apple Pay simply because I don't have an iPhone 6 or 6 Plus. You know, it's just the, your basic bare bones 5S, nothing fancy uh, going on. I don't have an Apple Watch or an iWatch or whatever it's called because Apple hasn't really released it yet. But uh, anyway... According to a new report, Samsung is in talks with a startup called Loop Pay to create its own Apple Pay competitor. Apparently, the deal hasn't been finalized yet, and it could still fall apart, although Samsung seems to already have a working prototype of the payments system. Samsung's Apple Pay competitor is supposed to arrive in the first half of 2015, likely as one of the main features of the company's upcoming Galaxy S6. So uh, Loop Pay's technology can wirelessly transmit the same information a credit card holds to a store's checkout equipment without the owner having to swipe the card. Um, Loop Pay uses a technology called Magnetic Secure Transmission, which mimics card swiping and makes it automatically compatible with 90% of U.S. stores, including Walmart, Target, Macy's, and Starbucks. So... There's only one catch. In order to use it, you either have to have it incorporated in the phone or use one of the company's cases or accessories that have the technology embedded in them. Kind of a bummer, but uh, not really much different than Apple Pay where you have to have an iWatch or an iPhone 6 or 6 Plus in order to take advantage of it. So it should be interesting to see how this whole electronics payment thing will take off. Apple's actually kind of a little bit leading uh, the charge here at least in terms of how ambitious they're being so should be pretty interesting from pcworld.com internet tax moratorium extended again a one-year extension to a u.s moratorium on internet taxes internet access taxes was buried in the u.s 1.1 trillion dollar government spending bill passed by the senate on saturday the Internet Tax Freedom Act, which also prohibits states from enacting Internet-specific taxes like email or bandwidth taxes, passed the House of Representatives in July, meaning Senate action over the weekend was the last step before heading to President Barack Obama for his signature. Uh, this will be the fourth extension of the tax moratorium, first passed in 1998. The ban on states and local governments passing access and other Internet-specific taxes expired in November. The ban does not apply to sales taxes and other taxes that have offline analogs. Several lawmakers have pushed for Congress to pass a law to allow states to collect sales tax from Internet sellers located outside their borders. Personally, I think this is a bad idea, although I can see why they want to do it because Internet sales have been such a huge thing. But how it's ultimately implemented can really be sticky for <laughs> the merchants. So, uh We'll see how that progresses. Um, anyway, the effort has so far failed in Congress to pass, at least this past session. Supporters of an Internet sales tax are expected to push hard for legislation again in 2015. So, we'll, again, this is something that's kind of been uh, simmering for quite some time, so we'll be keeping an eye on it. From CNET.com uh, in their news section, Curiosity has discovered... Organic matter on Mars. Molecules found by Curiosity on Mars have been confirmed as organic matter, the building blocks of all known forms of terrestrial life. This is kind of neat. The Curiosity rover has found and analyzed the first definitively defined piece of organic matter on the surface of Mars. The organic molecules consisting primarily of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms are the building blocks of all life on Earth. However, it is important to note that these molecules may not have come from life forms on Mars. Organic molecules can be created from chemical processes that do not involve life, NASA said, which is true because you see this happen all over the place, everywhere you have parts of these, uh, you know, plus energy. At this stage, there's not enough evidence to determine the providence, provenance of the molecules, but either way, their presence has meaning. So, pretty neat. 
the team responsible for that sample analysis uh, instrument suite have several hypotheses. The first is, of course, a biological process. Others include chemical reactions in water at ancient hot springs on the red planet or arrival from off-planet via dust, meteorites, asteroids, comets, etc., which, you know, Mar the surface of Mars is littered with comet strikes and all kinds of stuff. Um, so pretty interesting. You know, Curiosity has been finding a lot of stuff about Mars, so it'd be interesting to see, you know, what else they find as time goes on. Over at thespacereporter.com, we have another NASA-related story. Uh, the uh, NASA's probe to uh, end its 11-year mission by crashing into Mercury on purpose. So the Messenger spacecraft, which has gathered information about Mercury for almost three years, is about to reach the end of its life cycle. And they are projecting that it's going to crash into the surface of the planet in March 2015. So MESSENGER, which stands for Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging, surpassed its original goal, goals by far. It was launched in 2004 with a goal of taking 2,500 photos of the surface of Mercury. It has sent back over 250,000 images in the three years it has been circling the planet, providing the most comprehensive coverage of the planet's surface yet. This is awesome! Uh, Prior to the Messenger launch, the only other people to be sent to Mercury, only other probe, not people, to be sent to Mercury was the Mariner 10 in the 70s, and Mariner 10 only mapped 45% of the planet's surface. So Messenger has snapped photos of all areas of the planet. This is, this is really neat. This basically allows them to get a nice photo of, you know, pretty much the entire surface. So, uh... Messenger's run will come to an end when it runs out of fuel and gravity pulls it into the surface of Mercury. So in order to celebrate this mission, NASA and Messenger scientists at the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Science and Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University have decided to hold a naming competition for five currently unnamed craters on Mercury's surface. So check this out. Uh, you can be part of that competition if you want. Pretty neat. That will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com or down underneath here in the show notes if you're watching this on YouTube. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And for those of you who have, thank you so much for supporting the show. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. See you then. Bye.